Hey folks, today's guests need very little introduction for the statistical audience. We've got David Madigan and Demisi Elamehu here to discuss the risks and opportunities in AI for drug development and the upcoming Pfizer Columbia Symposium, which will be focusing on both those things, the risks and the opportunities. Mahela Vandashar will be following up on this subject later this month. So if you want to hear from her when her episode comes out, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, leave a like. And now we'll do our little intro jingle and then on to the show. Welcome to the Pod of Asclepius, your healthcare technology podcast for the technical crowd. We're bringing the technical experts of engineering, entrepreneurship, data science, and regulation straight to your earbuds. And here's your host, Glenn Wright Colopy. All right, so David Madigan, perhaps you could give us an overview of who you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm uh, David Madigan. I'm a professor of statistics at Columbia University. I've been there for, this is my 13th year, uh, I think. Uh, previously, I was at Rutgers. Uh, I was also a faculty member at the University of Washington. Um, I've My research interests have been have varied over the years. I've done a lot of Bayesian things of one sort or another. I've done a lot of work on graphical models. Um, but for the last 10 years or so, I've been um, very much focused on, on questions that arise in healthcare and analyzing large scale healthcare data of one sort or another um, to try and generate evidence to guide uh, to guide the practice of healthcare. Excellent. Well, I think that's a fairly modest introduction, if I must say. But uh, you, um, but yeah, d d d definitely that does, that does cover all, all the bases of everything that you work on. And now, uh, Demisi, could you introduce yourself and your research interests? I would be happy to do so. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Demisi Alamayo. I head uh, the statistical research and uh, data science uh, group uh, at Pfizer. Uh, this is a group uh, that focuses on uh, the application and the development of uh, novel methods for uh, clinical trial design, uh, analysis, and reporting. And uh, in particular, we, we specialize in, in uh, novel uh, approaches for uh, optimal design. Uh, we do real-world uh, data uh, analysis and evidence generation. And also, uh, we, we do uh, enterprise-wide uh, uh, consulting on uh, important uh, problems uh, pertaining to uh, drug development. Uh, personally, my my research interest is in novel approaches for trial design. In particular, uh, I have uh, focused on historical controls uh, as well as uh, uh, adaptive designs such as uh, multi-armed bandit problem uh, uh, you know, applications in the clinical trial co context. Uh, we are also interested in the interface between the regulatory and the statistics. In fact, currently we are uh, working on a monograph that focuses in this particular area and something that is related of course to the theme of uh, the upcoming uh, AI conferences of course uh, causal inference uh, using uh, data from uh, uh, sources that are not strictly randomized controlled trials uh, so, so that's uh, in essence you know my my role at Pfizer and uh, my research interest yeah, I'm definitely interested to hear that, and especially um, I didn't realize that you work so much in historical control trial work as well. Um, it seems like there's a bit of a continuity or connection there with what you're talking about, where historical control trials, a lot of the effort is to maximize the amount of data that's available and maximize the amount of data that you use from previous uh, patients, for example, who aren't actually strictly in, for example, a randomized control trial. What, what are some of the connections that you see between the uh, your pr past work in historical control trials and now some of this causal inference type work? Yeah, as, as you know, clinical trial uh, and drug development is a fairly expensive uh, endeavor. So leveraging data from uh, uh, other sources uh, to complement uh, uh, trial design is an important aspect of now drug development. Uh, these are very difficult uh, pro problems, of course. They, they require a careful uh, 
uh, evaluation of uh, the research hypothesis, uh, the regulatory framework, and also the stage of uh, the, the drug development. Uh, for, for instance, uh, in the context of historical control, uh, the, the main issue is you know, handling uh, confounding and ensuring the exchangeability of information. So th this requires, of course, application of state-of-the-art statistical techniques. Uh, this is an area where the Bayesian inference has been particularly uh, impactful, uh, and the regulatory agencies are actually open to uh, exploring such options, since they have in indeed uh, uh, approved uh, drugs uh, in certain situations, like rare diseases, where such data was used uh, to augment uh, the typical clinical trial data. The conference is called The Risks and Opportunities of AI in Clinical Drug Development. Just to set the stage, what are you defining AI to be, and why are we focusing on clinical drug development? Right. So um, I, I perhaps maybe I'll just back up a step or two. So Demisi, uh, I know who you're going to hear from, and, and I uh, were having some conversations and have had conversations uh, over a long period of time um, about AI and AI in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and we've, you know, and we're kind of observing that um, while AI is having profound effects in some industries, um, you know, and it appears that the impact within the pharmaceutical uh, uh, enterprise, both academic and, and, and commercial, um, you know, is is has not been so rapid or so profound. So, so in that context, what we mean by it, we 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 both take a fairly broad view as to what AI is. Um, so a lot of the excitement, I think, is around deep learning um, and uh, related kind of algorithms which have made you know, dramatic progress in some problems, in particular with unstructured data. But when we're using the term, we're certainly we're certainly not being as narrow as as deep learning. So what we have in mind is, you know, basically anything where you're you're trying to extract value from very large scale data. Um, so it's it certainly, you know, we're thinking of, of in terms of including all of machine learning um, and, and lock, you know, even parts of uh, sort of the, the statistical world, uh, we would include under this kind of general rubric of, of AI. So it's not, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're trying to be broad, but trying to make use of the, uh, the, the phrase that has got everyone's attention. Yeah, I certainly appreciate the big tent approach to uh, the definition of AI, because as you know, it means a lot of things to a lot of people, whether it's the yep. more broadly just speaking about uh, data analysis in general, or alternatively data analysis as it steps farther and farther out of human supervision. And so where the artificial becomes much more of the issue where whether or not it's the decisions being made or simply the inference around the statistical models being uh, fitted or developed, where mm -hmm. if if these things are being increasingly taken out of a person's hand, a lot of our current um, methodologies obviously need a second glance to make sure that they are behaving as we always anticipate them to. Indeed, indeed. Now, one thing I find very curious as well is I have a four-volume set on my shelf, not not here, it's actually in my office at Columbia, um, called the Encyclopedia of Artificial Intelligence, and it dates from, I think, the 1980s. There's not a single thing in there about data analysis or data. It's all about first order order logic and symbolic reasoning and rule based systems, and it's it's just amazing how how a term you know can come to be completely redefined. Yeah, I would actually I would just point out that uh, you know if you want to say artificial intelligence isn't just something that's non human acting intelligently or in a useful way, we could take for example just a litmus test, like a little piece of litmus paper. It is actually providing something quite useful in a clinical or scientific setting. Um, Obviously, it doesn't meet our deep learning method, but um, mm -hmm. things like that um, or just, you know, uh, heart rate monitors, things that um, have been around for a long time with ECG, where we now take them for granted, although they are forms of intelligent uh, computing. But sure. uh, so on so on to that issue, um, uh, the conference is about the risks and the opportunities, and you've assembled a really great lineup of speakers. What are some of the main overarching themes do you think that are going to be connecting them? Is it going to be on the risks or the opportunities, or what? What? What tends to be people's focus? Um, it's 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 a you know it's across it varies across the board. I think we'll, we'll cover some of the uh, risks, but certainly talk about the opportunities. Um, we, we clearly the the theme sort of resonates with people. Uh, we we had 
we I, maybe we didn't have a hundred percent acceptance, but we 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 came very close to having hundred percent acceptance. Basically, people were, you know, um, interested in the topic and and, and excited to come. Um, we didn't we didn't um, we didn't control it very tightly. Uh, we were more interested in just getting um, you know, bright, engaged people in the room, um, let them talk about what they want, and then we're hoping to have some really interesting discussions. Um, and we have discussions for some of the talks, and there'll be you know. Uh, opportunities for uh, for discussion. So we're it, it, that was kind of more the spirit of it was to get together a bunch of um, folks, um, a mix of people from pharmaceutical industry and from academia, which is exactly what, what we have, um, who are interested in these topics and have thought about these topics, and just get them in a room, have some talks, but uh, you know uh, have have a lot of discussion just to see to learn from each other uh, for sure. Um, but also just to get a sense of where we might, where we might be headed with with regards to you know AI in 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 this realm of drug development. Well, on to build off of that theme of simply letting smart, capable people talk about what interests them. Uh, what mm -hmm. would you say are, for example, some of the areas where drug development is most susceptible to the risks that AI-based systems use? Where do you think that? The risks are in these systems that we're currently needing to really try to mitigate. Right. So, um, it, it, actually, it might be worth just um, talking a little bit about, about the phrase "clinical drug development." So um, that you know that that kind of runs the gamut all the way from drug discovery, um, all the way through you know post marketing and drug safety issues and and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're we're there is quite a lot of work going on uh, that you might call AI and in the realm of drug discovery, right? So finding um, targets for drugs, finding new molecules um, and, and, and so on. That's kind of, it's, we're not so much focused on that end of this, uh, of this um, life cycle, if you will. Um, you know, so there is interesting work uh, going on and actually at the, um, um, the ACM IMS Foundations of Data Science Symposium last summer, which uh, the, 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 uh, the, the first full version of that conference is going to take place this, this September. Um, we, had, we, we had quite a, we had a number of talks. Um, Daphne Kohler, for example, from Incitro gave a very interesting talk about AI in drug discovery. Um, so we're aware that there's a whole world you know, of, of, uh, of activity uh, at that end of the spectrum. What we are more focused on is kind of from the moment of, um, say, human testing forwards. Um, so we're interested in um, potential uses of AI for testing drugs, say, in humans. I guess it could be in in uh, in, in, uh, in vitro as well or in, in animals, but in particular in humans, um, through um, methods for better understanding how drugs work and for whom they work you know, in the real world. Um, through, through basically, you know, individualized, you know, personalized medicine, precision medicine, whatever you want, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that it's it's we're more at that end than at the early kind of drug discovery um, stage in, in what we're focusing on. Yeah, that's in, that's interesting because you know it's in the stages that you're talking about where many of the I guess you'd say the most deliriousest effects the true problems that crop up when your science is not operating as you expect or when the risks involved, um, when the unexpected risks, this is where they begin to crop up. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously when you're in the in the process of simply identifying um, targets and things like that, you know, when you're doing in vitro work, for example, mm -hmm. the risks to the human population is relatively low. The main thing you're risking is lab scientist time which while useful is not the same as a person having an extreme adverse event. Um, right. So I guess when we're, we're talking about the risks in that regard, this is one of the highest stakes of the actual clinical science where you're, for example, truly stepping out into that unknown. And you can imagine that there's that further fear compounded when you're stepping out into the unknown using AI tools, which of course mm -hmm. have their own unknown unexpected elements as well. Um, That's right. That's right. Um, and you know, I think just to, to zero in on one example that uh, um, there is going to be a talk on this particular risk. Um, uh, so Amal Navath from from Penn um, is going to talk about something he calls treatment contamination. And I think this is this is a very significant issue um, with regard to the use of AI for personalized medicine. So there's a lot of work going on um, right now. I'm I'm 
periphery involved in some of this. Um, it goes on within uh, uh, Odyssey, which I'll, I'll say more about in a few minutes. Um, but but more broadly, is predictive modeling in healthcare. So um, you know we now have ultra large scale electronic health record databases. Um, so you know the we, we have we can gather in, in a distributed database uh, electronic health records for north of 500 million people. Um, so it's a non-trivial fraction of the of the world's population. We can also add in not for 500 million people, but we can add genomic data for some individuals. We can add sensor data. We can there's other things we can we can add to that. But this the core medical record data, drugs, diagnoses, procedures, and and so on. Um, the, you know the, those kind of data over time, multiple years worth of data, say, are now available for hundreds of millions of people. So it's a very tempting target for uh, predictive modeling. And whether it's it's you know some sort of current neural network that we we would we would we would like to call AI or it's or it's logistic regression or a Cox model, um, you know it's we now have vast amounts of data. So you would think to yourself, gee, um, you know uh, we really should be able to predict what's going to happen to a patient with a, you know, with a given configuration of of uh, signs and symptoms and demographics. Um, but it, it, it turns out there are some subtleties in this that are, are really uh, very tricky. So one of them is when you, you tend to replicate biases in healthcare delivery when you fit models to these data. That's, that's one issue. Um, a second issue that is what AMOL is going to talk about um, is what, what, what people refer to as treatment polluted outcomes. And I think it's a very important issue. So let, let, me, let me explain. Um, and the, the, the treatment polluted outcome is the term that, that uh, I believe AMOL has, has coined. Here's the problem. Let's imagine um, you uh, would like to consider patients who are newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So one of the issues with and the millions of people have atrial fibrillation in, uh, in the United States and around the world. Um, so one of the issues when you have atrial fibrillation is you're at higher risk of stroke. So you're at higher risk of forming clots that can go to your brain um, and cause damage. So a key decision, uh, once you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, the key clinical decision, uh, as I understand it, is whether or not to put the patient on a blood thinner. So if you put them on a blood thinner, you decrease the risk of clots and decrease the risk of stroke. But when, when, when you put someone on a blood thinner, they're at higher risks for uh, higher risk of major bleeds. So if you, if you fall and bang your head, you're more likely to bleed to death if you're on a blood thinner uh, than if you're not. So it's, this is a non-trivial uh, decision. So the key input into that decision is, is for a given patient, newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, what's the probability um, that they're going to get a stroke? And if that's high enough, you will put them on a blood thinner. And if it's low, you might not. You might wait and see. So I've done work on this. I have a, a paper with a PhD student from a few years ago where we, we fit a predictive model. We identify tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individuals with atrial fibrillation in, in these databases. And then you look at a window in time after the diagnosis, say six months or a year or, or, or five years, and you've got a binary variable. You know, the outcome variable is, did the person have a stroke during that period after the diagnosis or did they not? Here's the problem. You're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Healthcare does not stop. So the physicians and the patients themselves um, understand some of the risk factors for stroke are very well understood, like prior stroke, for instance. So if a patient ha, you know, had a stroke previously, then they're much more likely, they, with, almost with certainty, they'll be put on a blood thinner because everyone understands that this is a patient who's at, who's at high risk. So that patient, therefore, will be treated aggressively. Um, and any patient with, with you know, known risk factors you know, will be treated fairly aggressively. And it's entirely possible, it doesn't, it doesn't turn out to be as simple as this, but it's actually conceivable that all the people who are at high risk, none of them get a stroke because they're all treated. And the people who get strokes are the people who you think are low risk and are not aggressively treated and they end up getting strokes. So you end up with completely paradoxical phenomena such as prior stroke being seen as a protective uh, factor in any model that you build. So it's, it's totally perverse. So what you want, um, and so this is what AMOL, as I understand it, will, will be talking about, and it's, it's non-trivial, um, what you'd like is you'd like to sort of freeze, freeze healthcare at the moment of the atrial fibrillation diagnosis, and let's see what happens to the patient. Right? And then, then we'd be good. We wouldn't have this problem. But instead, the outcome is treatment polluted. 
So it's 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 at some mix of human actions, physician and patient actions, plus risk factors that go into what happens in that window after after the diagnosis. So that um, is a significant risk of AI, and there are many papers uh, in the literature, and there continue to be papers in the literature where people are using every machine learning and AI method you ever heard of to do predictive modeling in this space, and very few of them are taking this uh, issue into consideration. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not so clear. Certainly, it's not so clear that a lot of this modeling is useful, um, and it's actually entirely possible that some of this modeling is dangerous, and that it's there's a risk that it would do harm because of this, you know, because of this uh, of this issue. Sorry, it's a very long-winded answer. No, the, no, it's 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 important because um, it is important for people to know that you know the clinical uh, context in which the patient, in which decisions are being made, in which the patient is operating. It is it's you know not just the baseline isn't just changing over time, over long time periods um, as new t clinical technology comes out. It's coming up immediately as they've identified something with the patient. They're always yep. sort of tuning and fiddling and things like this. Uh, very similar yep. actually to the stuff that I was working on for hospital patients where the moment you would actually see that a patient started to become ab abnormal, you would, for example, see more nursing observations. And nursing observations, the moment you have a nurse there, it does then interact with the patient's vital signs uh, because mm -hmm. they're being mm -hmm. essentially observed more, prodded more, uh, white uh, coat, um, uh, hypertension, things like that. And so um, it's actually one of the interesting things where you would actually, you could estimate whether, you're more likely to estimate whether a patient was likely to have higher blood pressure by the frequency of observations Okay. So the frequency yep. of nursing observations, yep. because you could actually go and see them always clicking that blood pressure monitor. And so th that was about as useful as actually trying to use their own data to predict it. So, yeah, it's yep. things like that. Um, no doubt their arms got pretty worn out. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, that's a very good uh, description of some of the risks. Now, maybe, Demissi, you could tell us a little bit about the opportunities and what Pfizer's involvement with the conference is going to be. Oh, that, that's a very important uh, question. Uh, as you know, uh, artificial intelligence uh, has been applied effectively in a number of uh, industries, especially in the consumer uh, industry, industries, uh, industries uh, like Amazon uh, uh, and uh, uh, Google and others have used it effectively in uh, automation, uh, in uh, driverless cars uh, and so on, they, they have also used uh, artificial intelligence. But uh, when it comes to uh, drug development, uh, uh, it is uh, still at its uh, infancy for obvious reasons, because uh, developing drugs is not the same as uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, cars. So that requires uh, uh, handling uh, a lot of regulatory uh, as well as uh, healthcare uh, issues. But having said that, th there is still a lot of opportunity. For instance, in early development, uh, artificial intelligence uh, could be used uh, to generate insights about uh, new drug entities or uh, even uh, to see if existing drugs could be used uh, uh, in a new way. Uh, it could also be used uh, uh, to uh, enhance uh, clinical trial efficiency uh, by understanding, uh, you know, various uh, aspects of uh, patient recruitment, uh, uh, as well as uh, investigator engagement. Yeah, mo most importantly, uh, when we talk about clinical trial operations and drug development operations, there are a number of tasks that could be automated. In this regard, actually, uh, even before considering regulatory submission, uh, artificial in uh, intelligence could play uh, an important role. Now, if we step back and look at early uh, discovery activities, as you know, to get one uh, particular uh, lead compound, uh, investigators uh, have uh, to screen uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, chemical uh, entities. Uh, in this space, uh, artificial intelligence actually could play a role uh, by analyzing massive multidimensional uh, characteristics of the chemical entities, as well as uh, chemical entities that have in the past been uh, uh, found to be uh, interesting leads for a particular uh, disease uh, condition. 
uh, in drug design, for instance, uh, they, they could also be uh, useful uh, to deliver improved in silico prediction and the integration of uh, large uh, and diverse uh, uh, data sets. And most importantly, you know, you, you can also train uh, uh, the, the algorithms uh, uh, to interpret, you know, millions and millions of uh, research, uh, medical, patient and document data uh, and come up uh, with an interesting target or uh, a chemical lead. So the, the benefit is uh, uh, limitless. Uh, in certain situations, uh, it can be used actually to predict uh, uh, disease uh, conditions even uh, outside of the clinical trial uh, setting. Uh, that, uh, there is, uh, for instance, application of deep learning in a number of areas where uh, you can use it uh, to, to classify uh, disease types, to predict uh, uh, outcomes, uh, or uh, to, to in, in certain situations, actually, to, to perform better than human beings in, in image classification. So uh, the, the, there is, there is a, a lot of uh, potential applications. Uh, one of uh, the, the most important uh, uh, areas of application uh, for artificial intelligence is uh, in personalized uh, medicine, which is really the next uh, uh, frontier of um, medical, medical research. Here, what we need to do is synthesize uh, massive data about the individual uh, genetic characteristics, uh, their family history, uh, the, the data generated by wearable devices, environmental data, uh, and other types of data, and then be able to tailor uh, treatment to uh, the needs of uh, particular individuals. So uh, in short, you know, it is at a very early stage when it comes to using artificial intelligence uh, uh, in medical research and drug development, but the potential is limitless. So, so one of one of the issues that you know you're, you're raising and is obviously very important is how you know how we can be sure that we develop um, robust AI systems um, and systems that are that deal with the kinds of issue we're just you, know, you and I've just been talking about like treatment included outcomes. They're very subtle issues, you know, because we're dealing with if you will a live system, you know, a live person, live a healthcare system that is constantly intervening and 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 changing. Um, so. You know, in, in that regard, I think the kind of the holy grail, um, it seems to me, and I, and I don't know how many people share this view, but to me, um, the holy grail here is in the context of electronic health records, in the, so that context, large scale electronic health records, is to build a generative model of the medical record. So if if we had such a thing, and I were way off from, from doing this, and maybe AI can help. Yeah, that's a major uh, and, holy grail that you're talking about. When most people talk about yeah. holy grails, they're a little bit more uh, less ambitious with their holy grail. You're <laughs> you're actually describing one. <laughs> cool. But it's kind of it's kind of what we want, right? You know, what what, what we really want is you know, to, to really understand how a person's health evolves. We need to be able to model it, um, and then understand you know um, use that model to make inference about about um, cause and effect, um, use it for prediction. Um, and there have been some efforts. So there are there's um, there's interesting work um, that is quite primitive in way in in, in very many ways um, on building simulators. So it will be very valuable. One one of the reasons that you want a generative model. Um, the, 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 it's not the prime. The primary reason is to understand healthcare and to understand humans. Uh, but one reason that you'd like to have a generative model is to be able to generate um, simulated data, fake data. Because one of the problems that is in this area is uh, is or are you know valid concerns about privacy. So you know re researchers working in this field generally can get access to data, um, but you you know these are not the kind of data that you can put on a on a website and make publicly available. So reproducibility, for example, is quite a concern. We you know e even in my own work, we recently published a paper in the Lancet where we did a very large scale uh, observational study, high dimensional observational study of hypertension care for uh, a large number of hypertension treatments and a large number of outcomes. The code is available on the Odyssey website, which I guess we still need to talk about Odyssey. Um, the code is available. And if you had the data, you could reproduce the results in the paper, but you can't have the data because they're, they're commercial. Right? So there are vendors 
that buy data from healthcare systems and insurance companies, uh, clean them, aggregate them, and then sell them. Um, so it's you know, if, if you can write a large check, you can get access to the data, um, or you can cozy up to someone who has the data, which is what a lot of people do. But it's very unsatisfactory, right? So you know what 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 we really would like to have is a generative model that generates high fidelity electronic health records. Um, and then, we, we, which, which could then be shared freely um, and used as test beds and used for competitions and for uh, predictive modeling competitions, for causal inference competitions um, and so on. So th there is some work uh, out there. Um, there's something called Cynthia in particular, which is an effort to, ge to, to generate clinically meaningful uh, simulated data, but it's, it, you know, it's pretty narrow in, in scope. So anyhow, is so it, just an area, an area that's- Cynthia Rudin for data, right? S Y N T H E A. All right, cool. And on the issue actually of the fidelity to clinical data, because this is one thing that interests me about the idea of simulated data is that how can you be sure, well, you can't really be sure, but how, to the best of your ability, can you really make sure that you're also generating sort of the oddities and the artifacts of your clinical data sets? Because many clinical data sets seem like they're more of a, like a compendium of artifacts in the data than they are, you know, actual descriptions of underlying distributions of data and the correlations within them. And so what are some of the ways, um, just because I'm always curious about how people are handling this problem, what are some of the ways that you can try to ensure that it has is having those clinical or clinical practice artifacts? Or do you just say, we're trying our best and we're going to go for something different? What's in your uh, holy grail? Well, um, the problem with my holy grail is I have no idea how to do it. It's clearly a very hard problem. Um, I have done, I, I was involved in a project some years ago uh, to build a, a simulator where we used essentially a first order Markov model on a small set of, of diagnoses and drugs. Um, so we, you know, we fit first order Markov models to real data and then basically gave patients diagnosis and then gave them drugs to treat those diagnoses, which in turn resulted in further diagnosis and so on. But it, it was, you know, hopelessly crude, uh, possibly useful, maybe for, for some tasks, but, um, but clearly, you know, there's a huge gulf between, between something as primitive as that and having a, you know, a, a, a full blown uh, generative model. But I, I, but I think it's an interesting um, thing just to, to yeah, I, as I say, I think it's unlikely in our lifetime that we're going to see this, um, but it's an interesting thing to think about and to, to think of as a, you know, as a, as, as a holy grail, as something that would be, you know, to, 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 to work towards. Cool. So um, I'd like to touch a little bit. I saw a really interesting uh, summary by Adler Parat, who will be discussing the use of observational data to find, uh, to find natural experiments and how AI is complementing that work in the field. But maybe to begin, since you're right here and got the expert, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the OMOP Odyssey research field and how that is related to this. Uh, sure. So um, I'll focus mostly on Odyssey. O OMOP was a precursor uh, of Odyssey. Um, this work's gone on for about, these projects have been going on for about 10 years or so. So it's a group of researchers, um, statisticians, clinicians, bioinformaticians, uh, and so on. Um, be Focus. honest, it's mainly Patrick Ryan. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, our spiritual leader. Um, uh, but it, it, it's a group of people who are focused on generating uh, reliable evidence from large-scale healthcare data. Um, and it's, it is as broad as that. It's basically, Odyssey stands for Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a club, if you will, that, that people have joined, they've come together. Um, there isn't, there's no kind of command and control. It's, it's, it's fairly loosely organized federation. Um, there are a couple of hundred active researchers around the world and a couple of thousand people have contributed. There are Odyssey symposia on separate continents. There's one in China, there's one in Europe, there's one in the United States on an annual basis. There are a couple of dozen working groups that are active and some of them have Eastern hemisphere and Western hemisphere groups and so on. So this is, this is a huge sprawling um, enterprise, if, if you will, um, and what it's what what people in this group are focused on said is, is generating reliable evidence. 
it kind of comes in three, there are three broad buckets uh, of activity within Odyssey. Uh, one is, um, is predictive modeling that, that we've talked about. Um, and there's a very uh, interesting set of work going on in that area and a, a, an open source tool stack that is, that is phenomenal. That basically includes every predictive modeling method essentially that you ever heard of uh, is available in this in this tool stack. Um, a second broad bucket is clinical characterization. So uh, the the members of Odyssey sit on data that has been mapped to a common data model representing yeah north of 500 million patients. You can learn a lot about how the healthcare system works from data on that scale, and and it's global in scale. So we. You know, we, we, the, the group has done some analysis that are truly unprecedented, comparing patterns of care in Japan, Korea, Europe, United States, and, and, and so on. Um, so that's a whole body of work. And then a significant piece of the project um, is, is focused on causal inference. Um, so we, we call it population level estimation. So it's basically using these large scale observational data um, to estimate causal effects. Um, we've uh, we've developed some approaches and published a lot of papers uh, that we think are, are steps forward in ways of using data on this scale. Um, I, I won't get into the details, but I would refer you to a paper that we just published in the Harvard Data Science Review a couple of weeks ago um, that describes some of these methods uh, in, in, in considerable detail. Um, one of the challenges that we face is um, in, in causal inference using observational data is evaluation. So um, you, know, you can implement a, a causal inference algorithm and, and come up with a, a, an estimate, and so can I. The question is, are, are, you know, am I right and you wrong, or the other way around, or, or actually more to the point, is your, say, 95% confidence interval, does it actually include the truth 95% of the time, you know, or, or does mine? So one of the problems is that we, um, one of the challenges of research in this area uh, is we really don't know what the true causal effect is of just about anything in healthcare, right? So, you know, what is the causal effect of taking the blood thinner Pradaxa on stroke? Well, there are estimates of that, you know, in papers, but there you will find that they vary quite a bit. Um, and it's, 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 it's almost a philosophical, it is a philosophical question, actually. Do, does the true effect actually exist? Right? Is there such, what do you mean by that? Um, so that's a real challenge in, in doing empirical research and, and running experiments, which is the, very much the flavor of the work in Odyssey um, in this area. What we have focused on um, to a great extent is what we and others call, it's not, it's not a novel idea, called negative controls. So we've identified, in, in our case, we're focused mostly on the causal effects of drugs. Uh, we've identified, we, we've methods for identifying drug outcome pairs where we believe there is no association. And there's a, a lengthy process. There are algorithms and, and, and methods that we use to identify these. It's it's uh, it's not uh, hand it's not it's not a hand um, waving exercise. It's an empirical exercise to identify negative controls. I I I'm fairly comfortable with these. Many most of the people in Odyssey are fairly comfortable that they're probably uh, really they, they really are true negative controls in most cases. Positive controls are, are just much more challenging. So the, in our current work, we're, we're using synthetic positive controls. So what we do is we take negative controls, so that's a, a drug and an outcome where we believe there's no association, and we inject extra outcomes into the data using a high dimensional model, predictive model, to fake an effect of a certain size. Um, we're not, you know, I, I think it's reasonable, it helps, but uh, there, there are some issues um, with, with that approach. One of them being, you can't really then capture unmeasured confounding uh, in, the, in the positive controls. Um, so it, it's, it's certainly not a perfect solution. So that, that you know, to me, an open challenge in this area is how do you evaluate uh, causal inference algorithms not just on, in a, in a, on a large scale? It's, it's, it's not simple. Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, part of that issue of developing the synthetic data version is that probably what you'd really like to help guide your path is more actual data, yep. which yep. is the whole point of why you're trying to get synthetic data to begin with, because of the paucity of actual data. Yep, yep, it's exactly. So it's it's um, 
by, once you start, when I, once I insert the word synthetic in front of positive control, it's a second class citizen. It is not as good as a real positive control, but better than doing nothing um, and demonstrably better than doing nothing. If you, yeah. you take a look at the Harvard Data Science Review paper and you'll see, um, you know, we use the, the negative and positive controls to calibrate, as we call it, the statistical artifacts. So we basically take the nominal confidence intervals and adjust them. I'm, 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 I'm widening my hands because invariably it means widening the interval, um, essentially to account for, for a systematic error, for biases. And we learn about the biases from the negative controls and the synthetic positive controls. So we have, we have an empirical, pure, it's a fully empirical method um, you know, for adjusting confidence intervals. And then we can show empirically that they have the right coverage. Uh, whereas the not we can show and have shown over and over that the nominal p-values and confidence intervals um, from your standard observational study um, do not have the desired operating characteristics. Those, but the 95% confidence intervals do not, in general, um, you know, contain the truth 95% of the time. It's usually a lot lower than that. Yeah, well, uh, two things I just wanted to sort of like spitball for a second because I was just curious about these. One. Does adding other, due to issues of confounding and uh, the essentially just we can just call them broadly the correlations between these um, these entities, do you think that things like uh, like pharmacokinetic models, where you're trying to get a better understanding of the underlying biology and how that might have some effect, or alternatively, more like agent-based models? So it's I'd, for that I view, for example, the clinicians and the clinical staff interacting with the data as they see it. Do you think that those things are worth incorporating? Like, obviously, the more you add eventually, if it's done well, you can add value. But the question is, at some point, have we essentially gone, you know, have we taken too many high order, higher order approximations? Can those things be sort of smoothly integrated into these types of systems? Or is it more challenging than you'd think? Great question. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think the agent-based uh, modeling work that's going on, and there's lots of it, is fascinating. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any kind of integration of agent-based models with the kind of causal inference methods that I've, you know, been just alluding to. Um, so I, I don't know what the, you know, what the scope is. And, and ditto with the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic models, which, you know, there's, I don't know, 50 years of work in building models like that. Um, you know, what role do they have to play? And co coming back to the holy grail of being able to model human health, um, you know, do we need to go to that level of detail or can we build a satisfactory model more at the sort of phenotypic level, just at the level of diagnosis and drugs and procedures, you know, or do we need to go a layer below? I don't know. You know, I, I think it's um, a lot of very interesting, challenging questions. And, and, um, you know, all of these are areas where, just to come back to AI, all of these are areas where I, AI could potentially have a big impact. Yes, certainly. Even just for things as simple as uh, being better able to approximate more complex models, you know, uh, for example, just like with dosing procedures and things like that, where um, if you do have a highly complex, for example, mathematical, a deductive model where we essentially we take some basic principles about the underlying biological principles and you then deduce what some of the outcomes might be from a given clinical starting point um those can obviously they get pretty darn complex mm -hmm. uh the more you want to make them realistic and that might be a place where for example a machine learning method where you're going to take them approximation sure. or you you know just again actually it'd be sort of like getting back to measuring just you know observation and outcome or sorry, not uh you know, the, the predictors and the outcomes and just trying to get a more simplistic model so that you might be then better able to fit it into one of these other more complex models with more established value like what you've talked about. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm, these are all, you know, I think all, exactly the kind of questions that I hope are discussed at our, at, at our symposium. Oh, yeah. no, no. This, this is my homework assignment to you. I, I'm just, <laughs> just handle it. Cool. Great. And uh, I'm just uh, curious a bit. On the issue of, um, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, controls and uh, some of these um, confounding factors. Uh, Adler uh, Perot's discussing about observational data to find natural experiments. How does that fit in? Because, you know, when you think about causal inference and trying to understand, essentially what you're trying to do is recreate something akin to an experiment, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, that's exactly what, what Adler is, is doing. I've not seen the, the, the talk. Um, there is a paper of his that I've read that I think is what he's going to be talking about. Um, it's actually on the archive. Uh, so if you, if you search for uh, Adler Perot, P-E-R-O-T-T-E, -E, um, and he's got this paper there called The Counterfactual Chi Gan, Chi as in Chi squared. Um, so, um, which, I, which I read some time ago with, with, with interest. Um, so what he's, uh, fundamentally, when you're doing causal inference in observational data, um, you're trying to find to, to find two groups that are that are like each other. One group got the treatment, the other group didn't, or one group got treatment A and the other group got treatment B, but they're like each other. And so, you know, way, the, the, the ways of doing that are basically matching and 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 waiting. So, the, you know, matching is very explicit. Um, so, you know, you, you hear somebody who was treated, you try and find somebody just like them. And of course, the devil is in the details, just like them. You know who wasn't treated, or maybe you do it with with, with groups of individuals. And there's you know beautiful work, um, Paul Rosenbaum and Jose Zubizarreta and others, many others, you know, continue to do in that area um, and using dynamic programming algorithms to do it now on a very large scale. Um, the alternative approach is is waiting. So you you perhaps include one of the issues with matching is what you do with people you can't find a match for, um, and the answer is usually you don't use them, and that that you know, that that brings its own baggage, you know, you know, you then worry about whether your sample is representative and whether you're going to increase variance by reducing the sample size and so on and so forth. So weighting methods, on the other hand, simply give more or less weight to uh, individuals to achieve a kind of a balance between the, the two groups. Um, the, the kind of weighting scheme that we're, we're all familiar with is you know, inverse probability of treatment weighting, IPTW. So you, you typically fit a logistic regression to predict whether you're getting treatment A or treatment B and then weight people using the, the inverse of the probability of, of, uh, of treatment. Um, Adler's work is in that kind of genre, but instead of um, fitting a model uh, of the treatment, uh, what he describes in this paper is more a kind of a, a, a direct method of constructing weights so that the two groups are comparable um, using a particular metric. So he's using um, a, a, a chi-square divergence, which I was not familiar with, um, and he's also using uh, um, one of these uh, generative adversarial networks, which I guess people would call AI, um, to you know to to fit the underlying model and to find the weights. Um, so uh, it, it's I think it's very interesting and novel way. I've, not, I've certainly not seen this before. Of if you will, kind of directly estimating the weights um, rather than having them as a side product of you know fitting a predictive model for the treatment. Um, and they show very, you know, they show very interesting results. I think it's 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 a very interesting paper, and I'm I'm looking forward to hearing the talk. So just uh, just out of curiosity, so is it the idea that essentially you're using you're using a chi square distribution to approximate, and then you're looking at, for example, like the divergence in terms of like KL divergence or something like that? Yeah. Or okay, yeah, yeah, it's it's like KL divergence, but you're lo you're looking at basically the distance between the treated and the controls in in the space of these, you know, the predictor variables that would not ordinarily go into a propensity model, um, you're trying to find weights such so that the distance between those two groups measured in this particular way using a, it's what he puts a Pearson chi-squared divergence, so that that is minimized, and then he, and he uses these GAN models to you know to, to actually implement that and achieve that. It's very interesting. Great. Personally, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to come out of this conference and hear a bit more. Uh, what are some of the takeaways? What should people know um, before they go and seek out the conference website, get registered, and get going? Well, uh, it's a one-day event. It's in New York City uh, at Columbia on May the 18th, 2020, um, very soon. Uh, I think there's a very interesting roster of speakers. As I said earlier, we had you know, a lot of enthusiasm from the people we asked. Um, the website is AIPM, uh, Artificial Intelligence in Pharmaceutical Medicine, so AIPM.stat.columbia.edu. I think there's an ASA, uh, um, there's an, the ASA also has a, a website for the conference, but I think it points to, uh, to this page. So there you can find, about the find out about the schedule, the registration, there's a mod modest registration uh, fee. Um, and I, you know, I, I encourage people to come. I think it'll be a, you know, a, a very interesting day. And while, while I'm, while I have your attention, 
Um, let me mention another conference I alluded to it earlier that I think some of your listeners might be, uh, be interested in. Um, so the um, IMS, the Institute for Mathematical Statistics, uh, that we all know and love, um, has for, basically created a joint venture with ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, which is kind of the largest academic organization in computer science and, and has 70,000 members or something. Um, we formed a joint venture uh, to, to collaborate together in data science. Um, so we had our kickoff event. We called it Foundations, a symposium on the foundations of data science last June in San Francisco. Um, that was a success. Um, so we are starting a new conference series called FODS, uh, Foundations of Data Science. So the, the website is FODS, F-O-D-S, dot acm dot org um, and it's a full-blown computer science style conference if you will by which i mean there will be uh, you can submit papers there'll be a program committee that will referee the papers there will be a published proceedings um, and the people whose papers are accepted will be uh, you know presented at, at the conference um, so that um that meeting um let me just get the dates is going to be in seattle October 18th to 20th. October 18th, we're having two, uh, two half days of tutorials, one by uh, Dave Bly on causal reasoning and the other by um, um, Michael Currens from, from UPenn on fairness and ethics and, and, and related issues in, in data science. So two superstars giving the tutorials, uh, followed by two days of, of presentations. The submission deadline is April 13th. So please uh, submit papers, get your students, postdocs, friends, uh, to submit papers to this conference, and I think it's it's going to be very important for um, for our field, statistics uh, going forward, that we are you know co-leading along with ACM, um, you know, an, an important conference series. Yeah, it's always nice to hear about these types of collaborations and people really adding to that big tent approach to things because there is a lot of value um, by combining people who are focusing on different things but still trying to find commonalities at least in their outcomes and in their research uh, objectives. Yeah. yeah, we very much hope that it will be a mix of statisticians and computer scientists um, you know, that, that will run with this, will submit papers and, and you know, make this their conference. Great, well, David, fantastic to have you on the show. Always interested to hear you talk about pretty much whatever you want. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on um, and looking forward to hearing from Mahela Vandershar later this month to discuss Excellent. her topic in particular. Great, David. Yep. Well, thank Super. you so much for your time today. Great, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. And Demisi, thanks so much for your time as well. Thank you uh, for uh, watching, everybody. Goodbye. Well, that's it for this episode of The Pod of Asclepius. We hope you enjoyed it and will tune in for our next episode. If you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave a like. You can also follow us on our other social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. Have a great story or presentation that's ready for prime time? Or know someone who does? Drop Glenn an email because he'd be happy to hear from you. We would like to thank our sponsors from the American Statistical Association section on Statistical Learning and Data Science, section on Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and North Carolina Chapter. The views expressed on the show are those of the speaker and not their employers, our sponsors, or anyone else not saying the words.